celebrating uh, a little bit of rain weather today. We're celebrating the fact that we're indoors. We're not having a camp meeting. We're not meeting outside in a, in a grove someplace. Uh, uh, but we are thankful to be here, and we are studying a series on uh, the Old Testament prophets uh, of uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We finished up Jeremiah, and we moved into Ezekiel. Both of these will have, you know, they could be a whole series of lessons just on their own. They're meant to be letters or groups of letters. And, it's, and basically what they are is it's a, it's a series of uh, messages that these prophets received from God and gave to the people. And it also describes some of the events that were going on uh, throughout that uh, time period. And the time, just as a refresher, the time was at the time of the uh, uh, the Babylonian Empire, where the Israelites had, had gone into exile. They were being punished for their uh, disobedience to God, their rebellion against God. They had, uh, as it was described in, in Jeremiah, they were described as adulterous because they were following after other gods and abandoning God or trying to, not that they 100% abandoned God, but it's often some of the worst uh, things that we do also is that we try to mix uh, our, our worldly religions and our idols in with our, our relationship with God. And God is jealous and God is um, wants us to be wholly his uh, and as he promised a new covenant um, with us in the New Testament that, that was described in, in Jeremiah and, and will be mentioned or referred to a little bit in Ezekiel as well, that there's going to be a new covenant with us individually uh, that, that's uh, to bring our salvation and the promise of a, a hope and salvation, all of these things that are so important to us in our Christian walk. Um, but the, the ultimate thing that we learn from these lessons is how do we apply that to our life and what does it mean to us as a Christian? Uh, verse, I'm sorry, uh, lesson number 11 is where we are. It's the moral responsibility demanded. And the subtitle is followers of Jesus Christ are responsible <coughs> to walk in holiness. Um, if you've ever been, I, I say around children, but um, if you've ever been around childlike people um, at work or at school or in your families, um, when something goes wrong, uh, everybody always says, uh, it's not my fault. That's, that's one thing. It's not my fault. Doug did it. Uh, Doug did it. <laughs> yeah, Cody did it. Somebody else did it. Um, or if they, if they fall into a, a bad habit or uh, an addiction or, or just bad behavior, they will blame, uh, well, uh, and, and, or, or we will cast this blame on them. Well, they're they're doing just like their father did, or just like their brother did, or well, you know, you know, their family. That's just the way. You know, that's uh, people will claim that on on the negative side, but on the positive side, we try to claim that same thing. Well, I'm um, a good Christian because my parents were Christians, my grandfather was a Christian, my grandmother. You know, I have this heritage that I claim, um, and therefore I can do no wrong. We, 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 we claim that once in a while, too. And uh, don't laugh. Do, do, she, I think she disregarded it and said, ha. Is that what you said? I <laughs> And so we, we, we understand from lots of scriptures throughout the Old Testament that the Israelites were very proud of their heritage. And, and they, they claim that as almost an excuse to behave any way they wanted to because I, I do these certain things and I'm from this certain uh, group or this certain family and God has blessed us and God has chosen us and therefore we can do no wrong. That, that's kind of the mentality. Uh, and they also had the mentality that if you're not one of them, you can never do anything right. And so we want to dispel some of both of those uh, in today's lesson. Um, as we look in the book of Ezekiel and we're describing uh, how people are supposed to behave um, and what they're doing. So let's go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 3. Um, and, and this uh, is a little bit of a prayer. We're going to do this, uh, this section here about Ezekiel's responsibility. And, and um, as we look at that, we want to claim some of that responsibility for ourselves. Uh, the, the, this warning of an impending doom in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16, 
It says, and it came to pass at the end of seven days, so just to backtrack a little bit, Ezekiel had been called, he had seen this great vision we described last week, where he had seen the, the, the basically the uh, a revelation of God to him, he had seen these, these miraculous uh, angelic beings and all the descriptions and all the, the, the colors and sounds and everything that he heard and saw and, and all the emotions that he went through about falling down and the spirit lifted him up and God began to speak to him. And this is then what he did uh, at the end of that time. So it says, it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. Uh, a watchman. That, that is such an important thing in a, uh, in a, a situation where you are under potential attack. And we know that the enemy is constantly attacking us. Uh, but, but imagine in a city that, that had walls or a fort or uh, any type of secure structure. There's, you know, there has to be a time when people rest. You know, people are going to go to sleep, but there's always a watchman on duty. And what's that watchman's responsibility? I'm going to look out for danger that's coming. I'm going to look out for an attack. Uh, you know, that in, in, in certain areas, they, they, they have people that are on fire watch, or you have people that are on security watch. All of these things that do, uh, that, that require somebody to be attentive, um, but they also are responsible for sounding the alarm. What good is a watchman um, if the enemy attacks and they don't say anything? Oh yeah, I saw him coming. Have you ever dealt with somebody that has done that to you and says, oh yeah, I saw that coming a mile away. Well, why didn't you say something? You know, you could have told me to duck. Uh, and uh, which, on that note, why is it people, when something's flying at you, they say heads up? <laughs> should be heads down, shouldn't it? That's true. Okay, that's true. But the, uh, uh, a watchman's duty, as it was described here, uh, he was to be a watchman for the children of Israel, for the nation. And he was going to describe to them uh, the, the, what to be alert for and, and about the impending uh, attack that was coming on them. And, and so in verse 18, it continues, it says, and this is God speaking to him. He says, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Well, that's a pretty ominous uh, statement, isn't it? Well, I'm glad he was only talking to Ezekiel, not to me. But, oops, <laughs> maybe not. Um, God tells us Jesus himself told us to go to the world, preach the gospel. He says that we want to warn people, tell people that there is uh, a judgment coming. There is a way of life that God demands of us. And, and the, the beginning of that is repentance. Just as John the Baptist said preaching, repent, turn away from your sins, and turn towards God and give yourself God. That is our responsibility uh, to do it. Well, I'm living my godly life, and they ought to just notice it. You know, that's, that, that is important. It, it, people do notice your God in life. But we also are required and instructed by God to take that word to them and to take that warning to them. What good does it do for us? Can you imagine, um, uh, to, to take it to an extreme, okay? If we get to that judgment day and we're standing beside somebody that we have, have uh, interacted with on a daily basis and they are, they are judged unworthy of heaven. They have not received salvation. And, and they look over at us and say, why didn't you tell me? You know, why didn't you tell me? And what are we going to do? Well, you know, I didn't want to be rude. I didn't want to be, it was going to be awkward. Okay? Talk about awkward. It's going to be awkward if we're standing there before God and that person is, is being punished and we were responsible for telling what we did. And that's what God is telling Ezekiel. <coughs> That, that, that as a watchman, as, as the, the, another scripture says, somebody to stand in the gap, somebody to, to be on the lookout, somebody to take responsibility for that. It is our responsibility. I mean, and it's a somber responsibility. It's an important responsibility. It says if they, uh, if they are sinners, 
And since we all are sinners to start with, we know that's the case, the scriptures taught that, that if we don't share that, that uh, uh, warning with those people, that, and they die in their sin and receive eternal punishment, that's on us. Okay? Um, and, and God is going to, to require that of, uh, of us. Verse 19 gives us the other side of that. Though. It says, yet, if thou wilt warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast to deliver thy soul. It says, you know, not everybody's going to pay attention to you, and, and we understand that as well. That we, there are going to be people that we uh, see uh, functioning in their wickedness, okay, and, and, and uh, living in that uh, wicked life, and we are going to warn them, and they're going to have to know this. And that there's nothing we can do about that. We can't save someone else. They have to, to get that to salvation for themselves, that personal relationship. But at least we fulfill our responsibility. And before God, we are then. Um, not that we want to, to celebrate that, um, that, that they died in their wickedness, because that's God Himself is sad, as we'll find out here in a later time, in a later scripture. That we shouldn't celebrate if someone dies in that way. Well, they got what they deserved. I tried to warn them. No, it's, it, should, it will create sadness, and, and there should be a burden for that. But we are not responsible for that. Um, and then, yes, go ahead. Yes, the so the parable of the soul. Absolutely. We, that, that one sows and, and one waters and one harvests. And, and uh, so, yes, we may be the one to plant that seed, but it is still our responsibility. If someone hasn't planted that seed, um, and I tell people that I sell seed for a living, you know, and, and when people say, well, I've got a bag of grass seed in my, in my garage, will it grow? I say, no. <laughs> Not unless you plant it. You know, and, and I guarantee it won't grow if you don't plant it. And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, that, thank you very good. Verse 20, is, it, it goes on with another scenario. There's, you know, there, there, there's a, uh, a evidence in the scriptures for almost every scenario that we might face. You know, we've talked about uh, the, the unrighteous that we didn't share the gospel with. They're, they're lost because they, they, they don't know. We, we see the unrighteous that we did share the gospel with, but they continued in their wickedness. Verse 20 is another example. It talks about a righteous man when he turns away from his righteousness. Um, that we're responsible to, to talk to them as well. Uh, and then if they repent and turn back, that, that's good. But if they don't repent and they die in their wickedness, then that, again, is ultimately their responsibility. Um, that there is, a, uh, uh, there, there is a, 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 an importance for us to know that God has us in mind and wants us to, to, to take this gospel message to them. Um, let's go down to uh, verse 21 that says, Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul. It says it's good for both him and you uh, that you would do that. And, and so uh, this is obviously the Old Testament. And we're living in the New Testament age of grace. So does this same thing apply to us? Uh, well, let's look at an example here um, in um, Galatians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 6. I don't know why I said 2. Galatians chapter 6. This is brethren. And this is talking to us as a New Testament church. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. This is bearing one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? To, to love God and to love others. Okay? He says that is the law of Christ. Okay? If you see a brother or sister in a fault, okay, so, so you see somebody that is heading down a wrong path, boy, we're supposed to tell everybody we know about that. They were supposed to gossip and we're supposed to know. It says in meekness and humility and love, go to that person and say, hey brother, hey sister, I see a struggle that you're having. Okay? Um, I, I see this as, you know, maybe it's something we've experienced in the past and we can use that as an example. Or we can, 
we can just say, hey, you know, I, I see something that's going on in your life or an attitude that you have or, or a, 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 a something that you're participating in that, that isn't spiritually healthy. What do we do about that? We go to them in love. We go to them in gentleness and with meekness. Because it says, you know, if you're too harsh, you realize that, that, that we may fall to the same temptation ourselves, that we are uh, subject to the same temptations they are. But we are to do it in love and in patience uh, and in righteousness. And, and that, that's an important part about it. Uh, our, that, that's, that relationship that we have one with another is an important part of our walk. Uh, and, and I know that's not necessarily all that Ezekiel was talking about here with, with his relation to God, but I think it's important for us to understand what God has for us. Another example of that would be in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If we have a, a challenge or a problem with a brother or sister in Christ, uh, Matthew 18 and 15, it says, Moreover, this is Jesus speaking, so it must be true. Okay. Uh, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall not hear, then, uh, I'm sorry, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Okay? Uh, that's, that's another example of, of our responsibility as a watchman. Okay? And boy, some people take that watchman responsibility very seriously. They want to look at everything everybody's doing. Well, you know, the, the, there are, um, we, God has blessed us with a fellowship. Okay? And, and when we are close to somebody, we will see those, those challenges that they have. And it, it talks about a brother, that somebody that's close to us, um, if we see them in a fault, or they have committed something against us, go to them individually. Don't, don't broadcast it, don't announce it, but go to them and, and have some scripture ready, have some, some, some counsel ready for them. Um, and then if that doesn't work, um, then it, there are instructions to go otherwise. But, but he says, if that, if, if that works the way God, Jesus himself said it should, then that brother is gonna be restored, and we are going to, to be able to celebrate together. Um, and, and hopefully we can do the same thing that God does uh, and not remember uh, those things again. So uh, as we go down to uh, the, the, the preparation, in verses 22 to, through 27, um, uh, Ezekiel goes for a time of preparation. Okay? God is going to give him a message to give to the people. He's going to prepare him for this time. And it, it says... Um, uh, in verse 25, it says, uh, But thou, he says, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee, and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. Um, and he's, he's going to make him quiet. He's, he's basically, not that they did physically bind up Ezekiel at this point in his, his uh, prophecy, but it says God is going to restrict his words. He's going to seclude him and, and keep him aside. Uh, just as with Jesus, you know, he didn't begin his ministry until he was 30 years old. You know, that there is a time of preparation. Not that Jesus wasn't doing something in those 30 years. He wasn't, he was working in his family's carpenter shop. He was, uh, you know, uh, studying the word. He it talks about him uh, uh, studying with the, uh, uh, the, the priests in the temple and all the things that he was doing in preparation for his ministry. But there was a time. Of preparation. So Ezekiel went through that, and verse 27 says, But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord. That's a, it, it, that phrase is repeated often in Ezekiel, that this is not what you say, but this is what God is telling you to say. Thus saith the Lord, and it says, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. He says, Some are going to listen, and some are not. Um, Jesus himself, um, in Matthew and, and some other uh, uh, areas, Jesus himself used the phrase, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Okay? If, if you can hear it, I want you to hear it. Okay? Um, and, and hearing and listening are two distinctly different things, aren't they? Um, I know that from raising children. They can hear you, but they aren't always going to do what you tell them to do. They're, they're gonna, you know, you say come here, and they don't always come here. Dogs are that way, you know. They're, they're, they're all that way. Uh, but uh, when we when we hear God's word speak to us, we want to to say, okay, what are you speaking to me? Because okay? sometimes we are not that person that's sharing um, the, the the message of, 
hey, you're, you're doing something wrong. Sometimes it's ourself that is doing something wrong, and we're going down a pathway that, that's not uh, uh, beneficial to our Christian walk. And we may have a brother or sister come to us and say, hey, I, I noticed this in your life. You know, can we talk about this? Can we pray about this? Can we look at that in the Word? Okay? When they come to you and, and give you that Word, hear it. Okay? And, 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 and research it and, and study it and pray about it. And, and bless them for doing that. Because that is their responsibility. As much as it's my responsibility for you, it's a mutual responsibility for you to do this well. And so um, if, if I ever, God forbid, if I ever make a mistake, I want you to come and let me know. If that ever happens. If that ever happens. I said it. I said it. Okay. And so that personal responsibility, it's not my fault. Um, it's somebody else's fault. It's uh, Ezekiel chapter 18 goes into great detail talking about that. And that's where we want to jump to now. And so uh, throughout the, the, from chapter 3 to chapter 18, where we are here, uh, there had, Ezekiel had begun his ministry of prophesying to the people. God would speak to him. And he would speak to the leaders, he would speak to, the, to the, uh, all the, 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 the uh, principal people in, in uh, Israel. They were in captivity at this point. They were, they were living in Babylon, uh, and they were, were under a lot of stress and strain. And the, the common phrase that, that, that's going to come up here, well, let's just uh, read in that. Um, in verse 1 of chapter 18, it says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, what mean ye that ye use the proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? Well, that's, I, will, I don't even need to go into the explanation of that. It's all pretty self-explanatory. No, not necessarily. But, but what, uh, what they're saying here is that the, the people fell into a habit. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, back when God was giving them the law, and tell, describing the covenant that he had with them, they, they, they would use, he, in, in a, in a, we want to separate out the two mentalities here. God would say that, that if there was sin in their lives, that the punishment would, would visit, you know, to the, to the third or the fourth generation. And so people got to have it saying, oh, well, we're in captivity of Babylon. This must be something that our fathers did. You know, it, it's not my fault that I'm here. It's our father's fault. It's, it's our leader's fault. It's, it's, it's their, this fault or that fault. And they weren't taking personal, their own personal responsibility for it. Uh, now, we know that some, like Ezekiel, they were still godly people, but he was still in captivity. And he could say, well, I'm here because it's not my fault. Somebody else did it to me. Okay? So we know that things like addiction, uh, abuse, poverty, not the poverty is sin, but things that get people into poverty, bad decisions that they're making, do often visit from generation to generation. People that are alcoholics are often children of alcoholics. And people that are were abused as children are often abusers as adults as well. We know that's you know lots of different categories. When people um, are raised in an environment of bad behavior, they tend to repeat that. But that's not an excuse, as, as we'll find here as well. And that's what the proverb was that they were using. It says, uh, the, the, the leaders were saying it's not our fault. We don't need to change anything. There's nothing I can do about it. It's because of something that our fathers did. We often will attribute that to people, you know, the, 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 as I mentioned earlier. Just because somebody's family did something doesn't mean that they are going to do it. That, that's, that's just not the case. And that's what uh, the God was telling uh, Ezekiel here at this time. He says, what do you mean? It, it wasn't... Uh, 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 promoting that proverb, it was a, it was a more of a rhetorical question. It says it, it, this doesn't make sense because that's not the character of God, and that's what we have to look at: is what, what is God going to do? Is God going to punish me because of something that my father did or my my grandfather did, or is am I going to be punished for something my children did? We we know that's not the case, and we're going to back that up here with some scripture. Verse. Um, Three says, as I live, saith the Lord God. Now, when the Lord God says, as I live, we have to understand he lives eternally. He says, that I live, you know, from before there was time until after time ends, God lives. And so if God says, as I live, it says this is a perpetual thing. This is constant. This is the character of God. He says, as I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion 
anymore to use it. I'm sorry, to use this proper in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right. It says, and hath not eaten, and he goes on for a whole list of things that, that, uh, that he didn't do. He lived righteously, he didn't worship idols, he didn't commit adultery, he didn't commit murder, and he didn't uh, 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 oppress people, and all those things. He says, he covered those that were naked. He says in verse 8, he says, He that hath not given forth upon a usury, neither hath taken away uh, or taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity. It says, I've, I've turned away from sin. Those that have turned away from sin, it says, and hath executed true judgment between me and man. And he that walks in my statutes, all those things. In verse 9, it says, This person shall surely live. Okay, he says, the person that does evil is going to die. And we know that's in the spiritual sense and the eternal sense. But that person that does sin is going to die. But the person that does righteousness, even if it's the son of somebody that did wrong, that person is going to live. Okay. So that gives us the idea that it's an eternal uh, mandate from God that if you do righteous, you're going to live. If you do evil, you're going to die. You're going to suffer that consequence. Uh, I don't know how much more plain uh, he needs to make it, but it's so important um, that he goes on and explains it in, in great detail here that uh, uh, he, he, he carries on in verse 10. It says, if he begat a son that is a robber, he, he talks about the generations, okay? So the, the, the first step, the father was sinful, and he's going to die in his sin and be punished. The son was righteous, and he's going to live. It says, but if, if this third generation, again, is evil and is a robber and does all of those terrible things that he, he, he listed, that uh, it says uh, uh, in the last part of verse 13, it says, He hath done all these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. It's on him, not on his father. The father is righteous. I, I didn't get punished for the sins of my children. Okay? Thankfully, my parents didn't get punished for the sins of their other children. <laughs> but, yeah, not, 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 the, not all. But, <coughs> but, the, uh, but, but that's, that's so important for us to remember. Okay? It's so easy for us to fall into that trap of association, guilty by association. Um, and, 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 but we also have to live in the, um, the understanding that our association will affect our righteousness. And so we, even though that our ultimately is, is our responsibility and we are not guilty of that association, we are also responsible for um, training people in the way that they should, should go. Okay? Um, and, and that's that's a, a it's a fine line. I mean, it's it's hard to to describe. It says uh, uh, you know the, the heart of God is towards His people. That God wants us to be saved. God sent His only Son, as we talked so many times. But that's that's the whole point of the, the lesson. Is God loves us so much and wants us to live righteous so much and knows that we are sin sinners and we are unable to get out of that sinful nature without His help. Our works won't save us. He says, I'm going to send my son to die for you because I want to do this. He says, and so if I'm doing that, if you, no matter what your historical background is, no matter, no matter what your family background is, if you come to me for repentance, I'm going to give you that because I sent my son to die for that. Okay? That's, that's such an important lesson uh, for us to remember. Okay. Uh, and then it, it, as it goes on down through, uh, to, let's go to verse 19. Okay? Um, some people then will say, well, that's not fair. Okay? Uh, that's the two most famous, two of the most famous phrases that children use. It's not my fault, and it's not fair. Okay? And so that, God has already covered the first one. It says, if, if you say it's not my fault, somebody else made me do it. No, it is your fault. If you did it, you are responsible. Okay? Uh, next, he's going to say uh, it's, it's not fair. So verse 19, it says, uh, 
in, it says, yet say ye, or in other words, he says, in spite of everything I just told you, people are going to come back with this argument. It says, why? You know, that's, that's why. That's the, the, just why is that, that the way it is? It says, why? Does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? Uh, when the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes and done it, he shall surely live. He said, you know, why is all that happening? Um, uh, let's go down to uh, uh, verse 21. It says, But if the wicked will turn from his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, and he shall not die. All his transgressions that, that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Um, God says, you know what? All those past sins are forgotten. They won't be remembered anymore. I wish I could be more like God. Okay? I wish, I wish, I wish. I, 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 you can't just wish it. You have to, 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 to believe it. You have to trust it. That when, when somebody turns away from their unrighteousness and receives salvation, God doesn't remember. Well, we'll sure remember it, though. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep track. Um, forgot. For, forgot. Just in case God forgot about it. Yeah, we, we, we want to make sure that he remembers all that stuff. Um, the, the, um, uh, and, and this misconception that God enjoys punishment, that God is looking for ways to punish us. God's looking for an opportunity for us to stumble. God's intentionally putting stumbling blocks in our way that we would fail. Or testing us so that he can prove that, that we really love him. Those are, those are false. Um, because verse 23 says, uh, and again, this is what God is speaking to Ezekiel and telling Ezekiel to tell the people. It says, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord? Uh, saith the Lord God. It says, And not that he should return from his ways and live. You know, that, that sounds almost like the New Testament, doesn't it? The gospel message. God saying, why, why do you think I would take pleasure in people dying in their sin? As we just said, I gave my son to die for those sins. He says, uh, you know, did I take pleasure in my own son dying for your sins? Well, obviously not. Okay. Did Christ take pleasure in his death? No, that was, that was a horrific thing to go through. Why did he do it? For my salvation and for yours. So why would God, why would we associate any pleasure uh, on God's part in us being punished for our sins? It's quite the opposite. Uh, he, he is grieved when, when that happens. Uh, but he says uh, 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 in verse 24, it says, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and doth according to all the abominations of the wicked man doeth, shall he live all his righteousness, he hath done shall not be mentioned. And his trespass, that he hath trespassed in his sin, that he has sinned, in them shall he die. Okay? So God here is saying that the opposite is also true. It says, no matter how much good you've done, if you turn away from that and, and do unrighteousness, then you're going to die in that unrighteousness. The New Testament bears that out when people get to heaven and say, God, I, I did all these things for you. Why am I not saved? Is it because I didn't know you. I didn't have a relationship with you. Your works don't matter. No matter what, even if it was good things you did in God's name, if you were, if you turn away from God and, and, and get into sinfulness, those, those good things aren't going to save you. Our relationship with God is what saves us. There's no gray area. There is grace. And God. Right. But you are either on this side of the fence or that. You can't ride the fence to get into heaven. Right. You can't ride the fence to get into heaven. That's right. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's all or nothing. And, and thankfully, it's not our, uh, it's nothing that we do other than our um, salvation experience with God, with Christ, and through Christ that, that gets us on the right side of the fence. Now, once we're there, there are certain responsibilities that we have. That's what we talked about today. That, you know, we are still responsible for treating people right. We're still responsible for not committing uh, iniquities and committing sin. Those are still our responsibility. 
but getting on the right side of the fence is an easy process. It's simply recognizing that we are sinners and asking Christ for his uh, forgiveness. Um, as we go into uh, uh, that, that uh, repentance is not just remorse. Okay? There are lots of people that are really, really sorry for what they do. Okay? Every time they do it, I'm really sorry. Okay? And the next time I do it, I'll be sorry again. Okay? That's not the same as repentance. Repentance is, uh, is a U-turn. Repentance is moving away from your sin and not doing those sins in you know, um, and, and through that process, it's not something that we can do of ourselves. Okay? Um, you know, our, our nature, uh, our human nature, our sinful nature will always draw us back into that sin. But we are new creations. We are a new creature in Christ. It, 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 it tells us there in 2 Corinthians that, that when we accept Christ into our life, that we are not the old person that we were. doesn't matter who your father was or who your mother was, who your grandparents were, whether good or bad, you are individually a new creation in Christ when you accept that salvation and when you turn away from your sins and, and don't commit to those anymore. And so uh, it, it, that becomes our responsibility that, uh, as Ezekiel was saying here, um, and, and we're uh, I didn't read through that, that entire thing, but I think it's interesting for us to, to, to look at. Uh, let's drop down to the very last uh, two scriptures here. Uh, chapter 18, verses 31 and 32. It says, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed. Those are sins. All your sins. Cast them away. It says, And make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Okay. Um, insert ourselves into that. It says, you know, each one of you, each one of us, myself, okay, turn away from our transgressions. It says, why? You have an opportunity to live. Why would you die? Okay. That's, that's, a, that's a question that, that is often, um, seems so simple, but yet people make the wrong choice so often. And it's, it seems like such a simple choice. Why would you die when you have a chance to live? And that's what he's saying. All you have to do is turn away. He says, I'll give you a new heart, that new creation. I'll make you a clean heart. All of those things, all of those sins will be passed away. Verse 32 repeats that. It says, for I, this is God speaking, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that died, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Okay? Or uh, turn yourselves, another uh, uh, translation of that would be repent. Repent and live. That's all God's saying to us right now. Repent and live. That's, what, what more needs to be said? I'll just, I'll just end with that. Repent and live. 